The cast that we're discussing today is a maxillary Kennedy class 2, cast number 4. The most posterior edentulous area determines the Kennedy classification, and we have a single edentulous area posterior to the remaining natural teeth, which is by definition the Kennedy class 2. Now the reason I say that is, we are not going to replace this second or third molar on this side, therefore it is not considered in the classification. We have one additional edentulous space, and that space is considered a modification space. So what we have is a Kennedy Class II Modification I. In the Kennedy Class II Modification I, we have a fulcrum line that goes through our two most posterior teeth on the arch. And those two teeth are considered our primary abutments. This partial denture is want going to want to rotate around this fulcrum line. When a patient eats sticky foods on this side of the arch, then that partial denture is going to want to lift up from the forces of the sticky food. When the partial denture, when the patient eats something hard, that partial denture will depress and it will want to rotate in that direction. So to counteract that on a Kennedy class two, we are going to put clasping mechanisms on these two teeth, which are called our primary abutments. On the other one in front of the edentulous area on the two supported side, we are going to also clasp this and it's considered a secondary abutment. On this molar, this molar is relatively rigid. It has three roots usually versus just a single root. It's a quite substantial tooth. This tooth can take rigid clasping. And on this tooth, we will place the clasp of choice, which is a cast circumferential clasp. We will usually have a rest next to our edentulous area, and we would like to separate the retention in that we will place something with a distal undercut on the molar, and we're going to also clasp the secondary button with a cast circumferential, and we'll look for mesiofacial or mesiolingual retention. Now we also have to consider balanced retention, so if we want direct retention on the buckle over here, then this would be, the direct retainer would be on the buckle over on our uh, primary abutment over here. But we want to separate retention, so we're going to look for mesial buckle and distal buckle undercuts. If aesthetics is a big issue, but I, it, it really can't be because on this tooth we don't have much of a choice but to come to the mesial facial on that tooth for retention. But if it were an issue, we could put an eye bar on this tooth and we could especially put the eye bar there if this tooth were going to be lost in the future. We would consider placing a mesial rest and a distal guide plate and an eye bar on this tooth if this one were to be lost in the future and then it can be converted very easily to a class one. So we'll look for direct retention, mesial buckle, distal buckle over here. On the other primary abutment we have a canine. So we're going to place first of all a cingulum rest on a maxillary canine because an incisal rest would look very very ugly and that Cingulum rest would also be a plating on the back which would act as our reciprocal component. We will have a guide plate here and on this particular tooth we're going to look for mesial buckle retention. Now when I have that cast tilted but when the partial is in final position that occlusal plane is going to be relatively parallel to the floor. So when I parallel that occlusal plane and I look at this canine over here and I let my um, analyzing rod drop down, I have to consider on that tooth, because it's an extension base, I have to consider some type of a mechanism that will allow for torquing forces on this particular tooth 
and dissipate those forces somewhat. So I'll be placing um, a raw wire clasp or an eye bar on my extension base side to alleviate torque on that tooth. Now when I look at undercuts, I, I certainly have plenty of undercut on the mesial buckle of that tooth if I wish to place a wrought wire clasp on it. And if I wanted to place a, a eye bar, which would be a, a originating from the cervical area, then I could also place an eye bar on that uh, as far as a .01 undercut. But if I look a little more closely, if I were to go six millimeters below my marginal gingiva, which is where the eye bar would, the lower border of the eye bar would be located, that eye bar would be standing out at that position, and it would be quite annoying to the inner mucosa of the upper lip when the patient is speaking, and it would be quite irritating. So we'd be thinking more of a wrought wire in this particular case. Many of the canines on maxillary arches have significant bony undercuts in this area, which precludes them from eye bars placed or bar clasps placed on them. So we'll be thinking of a wrought wire clasp. The other good thing about the um, wrought wire is that it will bring our retention toward the anterior. It would not be as aesthetic for this patient as an eye bar would be. But we'll look at that a little more closely as we survey our cast. As far as one other extremely important component is the indirect retainer when you have a Kennedy class 2 or a Kennedy class 1. A placement of a rest as far away from this fulcrum line as possible will prevent that rotation in an upward direction back here and it will bottom out on this rest preventing the rotation. So in the Kennedy class 2 you will usually find one indirect retainer placed as far away from the fulcrum line as possible. Now it is not usually placed on lateral incisors on the maxillary arch. On the mandibular arch it's not placed on any of the incisors. It's usually placed on the canine of the mandibular arch. So I guess another option would be if we had really heavy occlusion and it was really a deep bite in those four anterior areas one other option would be for us to move to our canine even though it's not as ideal because it's a lot closer to our fulcrum line than if we move up to the central incisors. So for rest we'll have a cingulum rest on our canine, a cingulum rest on our central incisor, and we'll have a distal rest. We want rest on a, on a two supported side to be next to our edentulous area, so it'll be distal of the premolar, mesial of the uh, molar. Major connector wise, in order to get up to this rest here, we will not plate this and dip down and then come back up. That would be quite annoying for that small space. We'll just go ahead and plate all the way around here. The other thing is when we're down to this few teeth, it's, we're going to get more stability by placing plating in there. Plating will not act as indirect retainers. You must have a positive seat, so it would require a rest, not just plating, but of course the plating helps to prevent some movement. If we didn't have a positive seat here though, with this, if it continually wanted to lift up, that plating could move those teeth to the buckle. If you have a positive seat in there, it's going to prevent that from happening. That rest will grab that tooth and hold it into position. So we'll have an anterior-posterior palatal strap. We have to go all the way back to the tuberosity and into the hamular knot with our notch with our major connector on the extension base side. And we do not want to end our major connector mesial to this first molar because we would have to cut across the palate with the back of our major connector and an oblique cut across the palate is very annoying to the patient. So we're going to bring our major connector across, come back forward, plate this tooth, 
and that will be our anterior posterior paddle strap major connector with a large hole in the center.